is my great pleasure to introduce the conference keynote presentation. And I'd like to welcome Maria Giron. Uh, she graduated from the University of Bar in Italy, where she received her PhD in high energy physics. Uh, in 2002, she joined the IT department at CERN as an applied scientist and staff member. Then she became deputy group leader at, of the CERN IT experiment support group. In 2012, Maria became the founding chair of the worldwide LHC computing grid operations coordination team and was responsible for the cooperations. In 2014, she was appointed the computing coordinator for the CMS experiment at CERN. And later, Jerome joined the management of the team of CERN OpenLab, taking over the position of CTO as of January 2016. So, looking back on this long career in IT in support of high energy physics, it's a great pleasure for us to welcome a leader of applying computing to solving some of the most challenging problems in high energy physics, understanding the nature of mass, and leading one of the largest scientific experiments in the world. Welcome, Maria. Good morning everyone and uh, many thanks uh, uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I would like to share with you uh, what we do at CERN and uh, what uh, is going to come uh, for the future in terms of uh, challenges in computing over the next uh, decade. And I'm also going uh, to uh, cover what uh, we think is going to be the role of technology to help us tackling uh, some of these challenges together. I'll um, give a brief introduction of CERN, its uh, complex of accelerators. I will then uh, present to you what the experiments uh, um, are made of and how we built and operate them, what are the data that we collect at CERN, and uh, how we store them uh, at CERN and actually worldwide on the grid. I will then uh, talk about the upgrade program of uh, the uh, Large Hadron Collider and uh, the computing challenges that are uh, linked to this. Um, and uh, then I will move uh, to um, the way in which we are looking at solutions about these uh, uh, computing challenges, uh, in particular in the areas of uh, data center technologies, computer performance and software, and uh, of course, uh, new techniques uh, like uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, deep learning that uh, are uh, already under investigation and uh, are going to help us uh, in order to uh, uh, face uh, in a complete way these challenges in the future. I will then uh, uh, have a couple of slides on how we work uh, with uh, other sciences and about um, knowledge transfer. So, um, just a brief introduction about uh, CERN. Um, CERN is uh, the world's largest European laboratory for particle physics. It was created just uh, uh, at the, uh, after the Second World War ended um, in order to uh, give uh, um, nations the opportunity to come together and work together for science for peace. It was a very important moment to do this, uh, in particular in Europe. And you can see uh, actually some images about those times, in particular the time of uh, uh, um, the Amsterdam meeting in 1953 when uh, the uh, uh, convention was signed, and also the first moments of the uh, groundbreaking um, in the, the Meran site in uh, Switzerland near Geneva, where uh, CERN uh, is uh, hosted. Um, today, the uh, stern site, this uh, Meron site, looks uh, uh, like this from uh, an aerial view uh, with the, the globe that has become the symbol of CERN. Uh, but it's uh, actually a, a, a larger uh, uh, complex um, as it contains also not only the sites where we have our offices and uh, uh, some of uh, our infrastructures, but also the complex of accelerators that you can see from this uh, aerial view. 
um, compared to the uh, airport that you can also see at the bottom of uh, uh, this aerial view, is we are really talking about uh, very large uh, installations and infrastructures. This uh, um, the laboratory um, really has a very nice uh, location because uh, it straddles the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva and basically occupies this area between the Lake Leman and the Jura Mountains, um, which actually give us uh, challenges in order to uh, relax over the weekends when we can. Um, the two sites uh, are one located in Switzerland and the other one is located in France. Um, and uh, uh, just uh, an overview of uh, who are our members. Uh, we had uh, 12 founding members at the beginning of uh, this journey, which signed the conventions in uh, 1953. Um, but uh, today we count on 22 member states, a number of associates and observers, which really makes uh, uh, CERN a worldwide endeavor. Um, we have a budget of approximately uh, 1 billion um, Swiss francs per year. And we support a very large community in ING physics of uh, about 15,000 uh, people who are located all over the world. So, um, scientists, when they come to CERN, they uh, want to answer the fundamental uh, uh, questions that we have, uh, in, uh, in particular in our field. So, we really want to probe uh, with uh, uh, our instruments, uh, the uh, fundamental structure of the universe, and by using accelerators, we can recreate the first uh, uh, the conditions of the first instance when the universe was uh, born, and uh, give some insights about fundamental uh, um, uh, questions like uh, uh, why we have uh, a very important asymmetry between matter and other matter, um, and uh, uh, shed light on. Uh, uh, the existence of uh, dark matter in general, how our universe is uh, made. Um, but CERN is not only fundamental uh, research, uh, very importantly, actually, uh, we also uh, are leaders in developing uh, new technologies in uh, many different sectors, from uh, accelerators to detectors, uh, information technology, and I would like to mention that the web uh, was born at CERN in 1989, and we have a very important spin-off that I will cover very briefly at the end of the talk, um, in particular, um, uh, given our expertise, uh, medicine is certainly uh, one of the spin-offs which are more important for society, so I would like to mention this here. A pillar of what we do is uh, also the training and education of uh, young scientists, this is very important for CERN, and we have a very solid program uh, dedicated to students. Um, but what really makes uh, CERN a very, very important and a special place where to work is uh, its capability of uh, uniting people from different countries, from different cultures, all under the purpose of advancing the, uh, the frontiers of knowledge for the benefit of all. And this is really a very special uh, uh, added value that we can have in a laboratory, laboratory like CERN. Moving on to the, uh, um, uh, uh, to the complex of accelerators, CERN has got a unique set of accelerators. Um, they all have uh, their uh, physics uh, pr uh, program, uh, and uh, I would say that uh, today probably the most uh, famous and the largest and the most powerful of all is the Large Hadron Collider. So this is where we're gonna uh, concentrate on for the rest of the talk. And you can see here an image of the tunnel with uh, uh, actually uh, the uh, superconducting uh, solenoids which are in blue, which are a, a few thousands. Um, from, uh, again, from the view uh, from before, you can see that uh, uh, we have actually uh, a a set of accelerators which are boosting the energy of the uh, beams and inject into the next uh, accelerator up to uh, the uh, last um, uh, ring of the chain, which is the LHC um, uh, collider. Uh, there are uh, four interactions points at this collider 
And the, these are the four main experiments that are built in order to uh, understand uh, the products uh, of these collisions. And uh, um, it is actually built uh, for financial reasons, underground, uh, about uh, approximately 100 meters underground, has got a circumference of uh, 27 kilometers, so it's a big uh, apparatus, probably the biggest in the scientific field that so far has been uh, created. Uh, the particles are accelerated very close to the speed of light, and just to give you an idea, uh, they can complete in a second more than 11,000 turns, which makes actually uh, the LHC certainly the fastest race track that we have on the planet, but it's also the place where the most powerful magnets and the most sophisticated detectors are uh, built. It contains a pure lithium than the one in outer space, and actually, uh, also contains the, um, when the beams are colliding, the hottest spots in our galaxy in very, very tiny space. And uh, we uh, can reach uh, uh, spots which are millions and millions of times hotter than the center of the um, sun temperature. But because we have also superconducting magnets, um, we also have uh, uh, to uh, actually uh, cool them down to very close to the absolute zero, to minus uh, 271 uh, Celsius, which makes uh, actually a CERN, uh, in my opinion, one of the coolest uh, places on Earth where to work. <laughs> so, um, what comes next, and actually uh, a comparison of uh, uh, the kind of time scales of the accelerators and their uh, uh, life, um, is given by this, uh, um, uh, this graphic. You can see uh, the LHC, um, which is running an operation in, in operation right now. Uh, design studies start, started as early as uh, 1985, when basically uh, the uh, previous collider, the um, lab collider, was starting to be constructed. So this is a very long journey for complex machines such as the accelerators. Um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the construction of the uh, next phase of the large hadron collider, the so-called high luminosity LHC, uh, just started uh, a few weeks ago, um, and the uh, operation will take us up to um, 2035. So typically a collider lives for uh, decades, and uh, um, we have a program with the uh, LHC which is going to last for an additional 20 years, so we're really at the beginning of a journey. But uh, because it takes time to think, uh, to design, uh, and to construct uh, new accelerators, we are also thinking of the next generation of uh, um, colliders, uh, so um, we uh, have uh, started uh, some uh, investigations and studies of the uh, future uh, collider, uh, circular collider of CERN, which would be located uh, in a, a very nice area between mountains, so between uh, the uh, Jura and the uh, uh, Salev mountains near the area of Geneva, cannot be much larger as to just fit in that space. And uh, you can see uh, the LHC would be serving as an injector to this new collider, which would be approximately 100 kilometers of a circumference. It would go also under the Lake Leman. So uh, that's for the future. Now getting back to uh, the reality of today, I would like to spend a moment to describe the experiments. These are really masterpieces of technologies I am always very happy to look at this picture. It's a great picture of the experiment uh, where I've been working as a computing coordinator. I'm still working in it. Um, it's a section of the uh, CMS uh, um, experiment. And uh, what are these, uh, uh, the way to picture uh, these uh, um, experiments uh, is really to think that they are like gigantic cameras which are built in cathedral-sized caverns. 
And in fact, the dimensions are very, very impressive. You can see the schematic of the largest of these uh, experiments at the uh, Large Hadron Collider, the Atlas experiment, compared to some humans which are standing at the bottom and on the side. Uh, you can see that these are very, very complex uh, apparata. Um, the experiments, because they are so big, are really run by uh, thousands of uh, uh, members of the collaborations. Um, they are coming from institutes from all over the world, which uh, basically means that we don't all, not only have a, a technology challenge here, but we also have a social engineering one. And uh, it is complex to be, uh, for instance, coordinator of uh, a um, a collaboration of a few thousand physicists who want to uh, analyze uh, data. So there are a lot of challenges in operating these uh, uh, experiments and uh, being in these collaborations as well. Now, another important uh, uh, aspect which is surprising often people is that uh, each of these uh, uh, um, institutes which participate in a program like uh, an experiment at the LHC actually has the responsibility of uh, uh, building parts of the detectors in their own laboratory. And then uh, these um, parts get assembled at CERN, and when uh, we started the journey of the LHC, I can assure you we've been putting together all these different components, and uh, uh, we have turned on these uh, large uh, detectors and they were functional from day one. And this is a major success for such a complex uh, uh, system as the one of the uh, experiments uh, in high energy physics. Going for uh, uh, some impressive numbers, at least impressive to me, um, Atlas is uh, about uh, 50 meters long, is uh, about 25 meters uh, high, um, weighs as much as the Eiffel Tower, and uh, its counterpart uh, experiment, CMS, is uh, uh, twice as small as Atlas, but is twice as heavy. So, no uh, matter why, the um, C of the CMS experiment stands for compact. Um, the, uh, it also contains uh, the most powerful uh, superconducting solenoid that has ever been in its kind, and the stored energy of this solenoid would be able to melt approximately 18 tons of gold. Now, these two experiments are the so-called general purpose experiments, so they're able to investigate large spectrum of physics, and uh, uh, they have been built and designed independently with very independent uh, detectors, which makes it possible that uh, discoveries can be cross-confirmed. And this is exactly what happened in July uh, 2012, when uh, CERN announced the um, discovery and the confirmation of the existence of the Higgs boson. The other two detectors are equally important. They have more specific programs in physics, uh, a little bit smaller in size, and the collaboration also a bit smaller, but still impressive. Um, the ALICE experiment is uh, uh, dedicated to the study of the quark gluon plasma. This is a state of matter which uh, uh, existed uh, just a few moments after the Big Bang. And the LHCB experiment, the B is standing for uh, being dedicated to study the behavior difference uh, between the B quark and the anti-B quark to explain, again, uh, the um, asymmetry that is noticed in the universe between matter and antimatter. Now moving to uh, the kind of data that we collect. This is uh, um, a, a schematic, and actually it's, a, it's called, we call them event displays, of what happens during a, a, after a collision of a, a proton and a, a, another proton. Particles are created, and then they can decay into even more particles, so events are rather complex in their final state. 
And uh, in, uh, at the LHC, we uh, have something like uh, up to about 1 billion particle collisions that can take place uh, every second. So it's an impressive number. Not all are interesting to us, not all processes are processes that we want to study. Some are already known. So uh, there is a, a very impressive data mining uh, uh, problem at the LHC in order actually to be able to anti-select what we know and we don't want to know more and actually be able to uh, select only those interesting, uh, potentially interested candidates that we want to study. And as the rate at which the data is generated at the LHC is impressive, and we have data generated something like 40 million times per second, this is the rate at which the beams are crossing. Um, we, we can't uh, uh, store all this data, would be storing uh, petabytes a second, so uh, really not what we can do. So we had to put a place, in place a number of important uh, uh, and smart filters, which we call triggers, uh, which uh, make it possible that we further reduce uh, this enormous quantity of data to sizes and uh, uh, dimensions and the samples that we can then afford to analyze and study further. The first selection is happening with the hardware, um, using hardware, and we go down to something like 100,000 uh, uh, selections per second, so we have reduced by factor 10 to the 4, and again we have another uh, reduction of 10 to the 3, uh, and we bring down the terabytes per second of the hardware filters uh, to uh, the gigabyte per second after having applied software filters. Now, the important thing of this step is not only that we are doing smart selections and we can't be wrong in this, otherwise we might be missing physics, so it's always a very delicate process, but also it actually that uh, we um, end up in, uh, in having uh, a complex data mining problem that uh, has uh, allowed us to, to reduce by a million and take decisions within hundreds of milliseconds. And this is really a very, very important uh, um, factor to keep in mind, especially for the future. What do we do with this data? We store it uh, first place, certainly, uh, in the CERN data center. So we'd like to spend a couple of minutes describing you what we have in terms of uh, infrastructure CERN. This is uh, uh, the view from above of our data center. Uh, and we uh, collect uh, about uh, 30 to uh, 50 petabytes uh, 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 per year per experiment. So CERN is handling a number of uh, hundreds of petabytes uh, to process and store per year. Um, the, uh, we could not host all the needed infrastructure in the CERN site of Neon, so we chose uh, a remote infrastructure. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, at Wigner, uh, in the Wigner Center in Hungary, in Budapest. The two centers are connected via 300 uh, gigabit per second links, which is shown in the picture. And uh, in total, between the two sites, between the Moran site and the, uh, the Wigner site, we have something like 400,000 processor cores and about half an exabyte of storage uh, between this can tape. You can see also a picture of the uh, um, uh, Wigner data center on uh, um, the uh, right hand side. And and uh, actually, um, the two uh, centers uh, operate virtually as one. The data, which is collected at CERN and then gets also uh, stored with the, the, the primary copy uh, on the site, has to be uh, accessed by uh, many physicists um, around the uh, around the world. 
And uh, uh, as I said, uh, each experiment produces between 30 to uh, 50 petabytes uh, uh, annually that needs to be, uh, um, needs to be uh, studied and uh, data analysis has to be run. This schematic is showing the entire data processing chain that we have in an experiment in high energy physics. From when the data is collected, you can see the uh, detector up there. Uh, we talked about the fact that we uh, generate data at uh, rates of about uh, um, 40 million times per, per second, so uh, 40 um, uh, megahertz. Um, and then we have this white box that explains this already the hardware and the software triggers that we apply. And as the decision making process happens uh, uh, within uh, uh, milliseconds, we call this online, so we do this basically in real time. Um, at the end of this uh, real time uh, um, a set of operations allows us to um, assemble uh, the data at the throughput uh, of a gigabyte per second, and we uh, have this so called primary raw data that is then collected and stored permanently CERN and another copy on the grid. But this is not the data that we actually can give to the analysts uh, in order to be studied because this is containing only the electronic signals which are coming from the millions of meteor cables uh, um, uh, which are uh, placed at the detectors. So what we need to do is to run uh, complex algorithms which are called the reconstruction algorithms given the input of the conditions in which the uh, experiments in that moment was producing the data and then we have the so-called reconstructed data. We then need to compare, we're not done, we need to compare this uh, data that has been uh, uh, produced at the, uh, and read out um, uh, through the uh, experiments. We need to compare this real data to simulations, to what the theory predicts in order to be, uh, uh, to be able to then compare what is foreseen by the theory with what we observe in reality and make discoveries or make precise, uh, precise measurements. And I'm getting back later during the talk between these two tasks, which are very important tasks, the reconstruction and the simulation. This is why I wanted to spend a moment to talk about what they are. Now, the, uh, the data is then uh, has to be made available uh, on, to the world. Uh, physics are located, these 15,000 people are not sitting at CERN all the time. And the way in which we have made this possible is through the worldwide LHC computing grid. It's an international infrastructure which really combines the storage resources that we have into a single, a coherent infrastructure which is accessible by uh, everybody. It's quite hierarchical, not only the way in which it's been designed, but also in the kind of uh, actually responsibilities that each of these so-called tiers has. The entry point is CERN, is the tier zero, um, records the data, reconstructs the data, and distributes the data. Then we have 13 sites around the world which are called the tier one sites, which are responsible for storing another copy of the raw data, our primary data, and then they are responsible for the processing uh, and the reconstruction and uh, the analysis. And then we have 140 tier two sites uh, which are responsible for producing simulated data and uh, also support the analysts for their end user analysis. So basically, we have uh, an infrastructure which is never sleeping, the, world, the, the grid, and it is located almost everywhere. We have 42 countries, so a little bit more also than those participating into the World Cup. And they are coming from uh, all, uh, basically all continents except Antarctica. We are working hard on that. <laughs> um, and the numbers, uh, um, just to give you a feeling of uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about the grid, I would like to emphasize a couple of points. We have uh, uh, today about uh, 1 million CPU cores. That, we are, that are available to uh, um, scientists. We have about one exabyte of storage, so we are in the era of uh, exabytes. Uh, we have about 
Two million jobs, we call them, is the pipelines that run on the grid every day. And we have uh, these 170 centers that need to be connected via networks. Um, so uh, I'm displaying here the one that is just between uh, the tier uh, zero and the tier ones. We have uh, um, links of about uh, capabilities of about uh, 10 to 100 gigabit per second. And of course, the trans transatlantic link is more important. It's got a capability of about 340 um, uh, gigabit per second. With this network, we move an impressive amount of uh, data, impressive at least to, to us. So we move something like three petabytes of data every day. So we are certainly leaders in distribution and in data management. And actually, uh, I wanted to spend a second also in uh, telling you about uh, uh, um, the data management problem of, uh, at the uh, WCG. is an important uh, and key area of uh, development. Uh, you can see uh, on, uh, on the left-hand side uh, the kind of uh, um, um, uh, uh, the distribution and transfers that we make. This is just a screenshot from a day, and you can see the transatlantic um, transfers. Um, so uh, it's really something that we do, makes our environment rather unique. Not, not many other uh, sciences uh, do this so much uh, um, nowadays. So in, to be uh, prepared for the future, when we will have more data, when we will have bigger uh, data sets, we are actually in the process of redesigning the way we want to handle data management for the future. We have 170 sites. We would like to go for two uh, key, uh, let's say, elements. One is uh, consolidation of the storage infrastructures, possibly making uh, some of these 170 sites logically connected and sharing uh, operations of the storage infrastructure in order to save on cost, not only for operations, but also for uh, data replication, which is an important factor of the way we spend storage resources nowadays on the grid. Another key element is how we want to serve the data, not only to our, uh, um, to, to our uh, sites that are on the grid, but in particular to those external centers which offer us great opportunities for additional resources such as the commercial clouds and the DHPC centers. And I'm going to get back to this in a moment again. So, um, moving to the uh, program of the upgrades of the LHC, I would like to uh, um, give uh, some, uh, uh, um, some more detail about uh, what comes in the future. And I'm starting with uh, uh, the time scale actually of the entire program, uh, the LHC from the start has been designed in order to follow a carefully set uh, out program of upgrades. You can see this uh, in, uh, in this schedule. You have uh, actually uh, periods of uh, run uh, which are uh, um, interspaced with the periods of uh, long uh, shutdowns. So Iran is typically three years, and then we have two years in order to make changes. Um, the second, uh, the run two, uh, started when I was in fact coordinator in 2015, and is going to end at the end of uh, 2018. And then we will have a, 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 again an opportunity of two years, the long shutdown two, in order to make changes. We will restart in 2021 with uh, uh, round three, which we see uh, the upgrade of two of the four experiments, the LHCB experiment and ALICE will upgrade in, uh, basically in the next couple of years. So there is a lot that is being done in order to pre uh, prepare for this upgrade. We will have again uh, a three years running and then we will have a longer shutdown, the long shutdown three is longer because not only some of the, uh, the other two experiments will be upgraded, but also the machine will be upgraded. And will be upgraded, uh, um, you can see here the curve of these red dots. This is the instantaneous luminosity, uh, the nominal luminosity that gives uh, um, a way to uh, basically um, 
is proportional to the number of collisions that are happening in a given time. So going higher in luminosity and the plateau in the air is going to give us, uh, uh, with respect to what we do today, uh, much more collisions, much more data that we need to analyze, but also much more statistics in order to be more sensitive to new physics. And this is, of course, very important because we want to have a machine that actually greatly um, has the opportunity of increasing the scientific reach. So the program, which uh, is uh, starting uh, with uh, an upgrade and a going up of the instantaneous luminosity uh, from RAN4 to RAN6, is called the High Luminosity LHC. Why do, we, why do we need more statistics? Because what we observe is incredibly rare. And out of the, uh, for instance, um, in order to have the sensitivity to observe a new physics, we need to produce for one event, potentially symbolizing new physics, say the Higgs boson, 10 trillion events are generated at the LHC. So, so we have an important uh, um, data mining uh, 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 problem here that we need to tackle basically every day in order to make possible to look for new physics or to do precise measurements. So it is very important to upgrade the machine because of that and just to give you a feeling what it means to look for one uh, particular event over 10 trillion is like you want to find that particular grain of sand over 20 volleyball courts which it's quite impressive, actually, uh, and tells, us, uh, tells you uh, how smart uh, we have to do some of our uh, things at, uh, in high energy physics and in particular at uh, DLHC. Now, another, I find, another impressive uh, component on, of all this is actually coming from the way in which the events are produced at the LHC. When we are filtering on one event, we need to read out a number of simultaneous other collisions uh, which are happening at the same time um, in the uh, uh, big pipe. And uh, today, at round two, we are handling something like 50 simultaneous events, sometimes it's a bit more. This is a record event from CMS experiment last year with seven and eight simultaneous reconstructed vertices that we need all to disentangle in order to understand that event that we have been filtering on. And uh, this average, we call, we call this pile-up, this average pile-up events of 50, which we have nowadays on run 2, uh, can be compared with what we had at the beginning, the machine at the beginning at the lower luminosity, so we had the lower uh, pile-up, about 15 was, was what we were handling in run 1, but what we are expecting for the high luminosity of LHC, LHC is actually the purple tracks. So we will be triggering onto one event, but we will have to disentangle it out of 200 simultaneously that will happen at the same time. And this is why reconstruction is actually a very complex problem also for the future. Um, during round three, I already mentioned it when uh, we looked at the schedule, uh, we will have an upgrade for uh, two of the four experiments, LHCB and ALICE. Uh, they will increase uh, uh, greatly their uh, data acceptance rates, exactly in order to be able to do more physics. But this brings in a couple of problems. The first problem is that we won't have enough resources to process data later on during the year, as we do, we do today offline. But everything will have to come and be uh, there and be uh, done basically in real time. As soon as data is collected, we will have to be uh, reconstructed and data analysis will have to be performed. And this is a major change with respect to what we do today. And we have to use new technologies in order to be able to do that. And you will see in a moment uh, also why. I wanted also to mention that uh, because we are going for an upgrade and because the two experiments will uh, have to uh, handle uh, more data, then their uh, high-level filter farms are going to be upgraded as well. And this is uh, actually, uh, a, a, this uh, schematics gives you an idea 
of uh, the kind of upgrades uh, that the two experiments uh, have been planning on in terms of container data centers. By uh, round four, the other two experiments will, uh, uh, will uh, be upgraded, and this is a view of one of the detectors which uh, are going to be built in the CMS experiment. Because we have more occupancy in the, in the um, detectors, we need to build detectors that are more granular, and this is why we have these three years in which the machine will be changed, but also the experiments will be upgraded, including the detectors. This is one of the major areas of work that is currently ongoing into the experiments. The occupancy is impressive. You can see it in this uh, um, plot. At least it looks impressive to me. And the capabilities that will come with these uh, uh, detectors uh, will be able, the granularity will be able to disentangle each of these dots that you see, which are actually um, uh, tracks um, uh, which are deposited into the uh, calorimeters which measure the energy of the particles. So, uh, reconstructing the, uh, more particles with more uh, granular detectors will be computationally much more expensive. And uh, a way to see what we need in terms of resources is given by this uh, um, distribution um, delivered by the Atlas uh, experiment. It's a forecast of what is needed compared to what we have today in terms of CPU and in terms of storage. Um, the, bl the blue dots represent what the experiment needs. Um, you can compare what we have today in 2018 to what we will need at the, uh, uh, down the line, for instance, in 2026, where we will operate in the, the machine uh, in the regime of the high luminosity uh, LHC. And uh, if you count here, we have uh, ended up with a factor 50 to 100 times more than what we have and we use today. And this is an impressive uh, amount of resources that are demanded, especially when you have actually have to deal with a flat budget. The curve, which is uh, um, uh, the black curve, um, which is displayed, is the technology evolution uh, which is expected between uh, now and uh, when the uh, LHC, the luminosity LHC will be running um, within the so-called flat budget that is what we have. And you can see therefore that uh, some of this gap will be uh, taken care of by the technology evolution, so by your work, and we will be left uh, with uh, something like uh, a factor four for what concerns the uh, need of uh, additional uh, uh, CPU, uh, so computing, and a factor eight for, with respect to what we need in terms of storage. And you can also see here from my, my these predictions that we will basically enter the scale in which each experiment is producing extra scales of data and not anymore the 50 petabytes of data per year that we have today. So it's a huge, huge need for the future, which is represented by these uh, factors. Four to eight is not a small uh, um, path, the one that we have for the future. A way to visualize this is given by this uh, pie chart that I'm just showing. So closing the resource gap in the next decade is the problem that we need to face. And uh, uh, I would say that a third is going to come from improvements in hardware, performance and capacity, so by industry. But uh, quite a, a significant fraction of this, two-thirds of this, has to come from new ways of doing things. So from innovation and revolutionary thinking, and we hope to be able to count on the collaboration with the industry in order to do this together. So my job currently is actually to make possible that there is industry collaboration with the researchers at CERN. So my next slide is summarizing uh, uh, the framework of collaboration that exists at CERN since 17 years in order to work together with the industry. It's called the CERN of the Lab. It's been there for 17 years, created for the support of the LHC program and its challenges in computing and software. You can see here 
the uh, technology uh, leaders that we have as members of Open Lab, together with the research uh, members. And uh, of course, the focus of what we do is fostering innovation and research, uh, uh, be able to perform joint research and development proje projects together, uh, and uh, expose technologies in uh, uh, quite challenging environments, such as those that CERN can give. Um, another important part of what we do in Open Lab is actually towards innovation, so uh, looking at technologies that um, uh, might come in the future, or might come um, in the future, it will depend, um, and also knowledge transfer. And we also have a, a solid program of education and training for young scientists through dedicated uh, uh, students' uh, uh, projects that we typically run in summer. Um, and we also have an important role for the dissemination of the technologies that uh, we study together with the industry and the kind of uh, results that we get in those joint projects that we do with these uh, leaders in uh, technology. Of course, uh, what the goal that we have for the next uh, three years and the years to come is to support uh, uh, the upgrade programs uh, and the computing challenges behind them. Um, so we just started the so-called phase six of CERNOG Lab, and the areas where we are going to uh, concentrate for the future are on one side data center technologies and infrastructures, or with the exploration of new architectures, but at the same time studying how to scale out capacity with the public clouds and HPC. On the other side, data center performance uh, uh, um, uh, with the hardware accelerators and uh, optimized software. And the last part is uh, exploring new techniques that will be enabling us in order to have these uh, components of innovation and revolutionary thinking that I was telling will help us to close the gap. So, uh, some examples of what we're doing in data center technologies are coming in a moment. When we are uh, faced with uh, a resource gap of uh, this magnitude, said factor 4 to uh, 10, let's say, there are two areas of investigation. One is uh, to be able to fully exploit the available hardware, and the other one is to expand dynamically to new computing environments. And I'm going to have a couple of slides on each of those, uh, complementary, and the, the two of them are very important too. So the first step to be uh, um, uh, fully exploiting the available hardware is actually coming from uh, um, using uh, uh, the uh, um, resources uh, via virtualized and layer services. This is uh, what uh, uh, CERN has adopted. OpenStack has been one of the early adopters and the largest, one of the largest contributors to OpenStack. We virtualized all our resources and we have something like more than 90% uh, of resources which are provided through a public cloud. At the same time, uh, this allows us, uh, the virtualization and the layering of the services allows us to be flexible and dynamic. And we're also therefore looking those, uh, in, in, for containers uh, within uh, what we do in CERN of the lab with the industry to even achieve more flexibility. Um, Scaling out to additional resources is something that we've been worrying since a couple of years. I've been in, uh, involved when I was CMS coordinator into a couple of uh, large-scale investigations with uh, uh, commercial cloud providers, and uh, uh, this is the result of uh, the investigations and, uh, um, performed by the CMS experiment in collaboration with Fermilab, with Amazon Web Services, and with uh, Google, uh, the Google Cloud. We've been reaching impressive uh, uh, scale-out uh, uh, tests where we have been doubling our resources for uh, performing reconstruction of data on one side with Amazon Web Services and on the other side with Google uh, in simulation. Reaching uh, to something like 300,000 cores, which is more than doubling uh, the amount of resources that we have in experiment uh, uh, today at the LHC. Similar tests have been carried out also by Atlas, um, uh, but uh, with similar results. 
Another uh, uh, area of work in, uh, in cloud services that I would like to bring up today is the, um, um, is the uh, project which is a EU Horizon 2020 project, Elix Nebula Science Cloud. Uh, the interest here is that it is a joint procurement of innovative uh, cloud uh, services together with other research collaborations. There are a total of seven um, sciences that are involved in this uh, uh, project um, and uh, uh, the uh, results will be uh, a, an hybrid cloud which is combining uh, uh, the data centers from the procurers, uh, the commercial cloud services uh, for the pro from the providers, uh, the giant uh, network and the uh, uh, edu uh, um, gain uh, network of, uh, for identity uh, management. Um, moving now to uh, the investigations that we do in the sector of uh, HPC, I would like to show some uh, uh, in, uh, very recent and impressive results which have been obtained by the Atlas collaboration uh, using uh, HPC resources in the uh, United States. They've been reaching an impressive scale of 200,000 uh, uh, cores of traditional uh, x86 uh, HPC cores, which have been used in order to produce simulation data samples. And you can see here in the plots the comparison with respect to what uh, uh, the uh, experiment typically uh, has. So really scaling out for, uh, for more than double than the uh, normal cores that they have is a, a very, very good result. At the same time, uh, experiments are also uh, exploring the use of uh, uh, additional capabilities which are offered by the HPC, which are the heterogeneous HPC architectures, and there's been ongoing work by basically your experiments, and I'm going to show a couple of results later. Studies will also partner with the PRACE, in fact, for uh, helping uh, exactly in this area of HPC for uh, optimizing uh, the use of uh, resources uh, and help the experiments uh, in order to uh, be uh, fully equipped for uh, the best use that we can have of HPCs, which of course are a significant resource for our environment. So it's very important to be able to uh, scale out to those resources in an efficient way. A, um, very interesting and innovative approach to HPC has been taken by uh, Deepest. I would like to mention this uh, uh, project also supported by uh, the European community. I'm, all, I'm personally involved in it. It's uh, um, an innovative uh, blueprint project for uh, heterogeneous and modular HPC systems. Uh, the uh, modules in Deepest will have specific capabilities from traditional HPC to uh, a booster and accelerator um, component uh, and module to a fully dedicated, dedicated um, a module for uh, machine learning and data analytics specific, specific workflows. And you can see here in detail who is participating into the uh, project uh, which, in which cell is also included. Moving now to uh, um, computing performance and uh, software, of course, very related to what I just said, is the exploitation of uh, a new uh, um, uh, high-performance uh, devices. Uh, but I would like to, give, uh, uh, to use this slide in order to give the overview of what is uh, ongoing uh, in, uh, in computer performance and software CERN. We've been having uh, um, really uh, major investments uh, into the software optimization because we uh, can certainly gain factors in performance in there and uh, close some of these resource gap that I've been talking about in my talk. And these significant efforts have been starting at the time in which multi-core hardware was uh, available and uh, the uh, clock speed was plateauing. Um, so we have uh, very good results in this effort which has been ongoing for years now, but at the same time, we have an opportunity uh, with the growth of uh, accelerated computing devices like GPUs and FPGAs. Uh, they, would, uh, they offer a, a, 
an opportunity for uh, better performance at the cost, which is uh, not only financial cost, but is also the cost of tuning the applications into heterogeneous uh, um, architectures, uh, which is something that we need to be uh, used uh, to, and we have started this journey a couple of years ago. At the same time, we were also exploring a different uh, complementary approach, which is uh, exploring lower performance and lower power alternatives like Canon. And I'm going to give, uh, uh, after this, a couple of examples of the work that we do on uh, alternative uh, uh, architectures. I wanted to, to uh, give an opportunity here uh, to uh, make a comparison of the work that has happened over the last decade and the changes that have been ongoing uh, in our uh, field and generally in technology. So we have started with the software that was optimized on uh, four axes, CPU, memory, disk and tape. And today we have ended up, thanks to technology evolution, into an environment which is much more complex than what we used to have in the past. So we had to grow expertise in order to make the best use of uh, an environment which is more complex, uh, even if offers, uh, of course, more uh, opportunities. So we need to uh, take the best advantage of CPUs, their caches, but also we need to understand how to make best use of the different storage um, of, uh, systems that they, they, we have together with their performance, um, the non-volatile memory included, and of course the axis, which is a, a, an alternative axis, if you like, of the uh, high performance uh, accelerators like uh, the FPGAs and, uh, and uh, GPUs. So all this to say that uh, actually we had to grow also a lot of, on expertise and uh, um, uh, today we want really to fully exploit the entire panorama and the, uh, the, uh, the entire set of uh, uh, opportunities that we have in this new landscape. Two concrete uh, um, examples of what we're doing, mentioned very briefly, but uh, I'm happy to take questions uh, later or uh, during coffee about what we're doing. For entry, LHCB and Alice also, they will be opening up their triggers. They will have to be more uh, accepted um, in terms of data. Uh, and this means that uh, actually uh, we, they will have to perform reconstruction and data analysis in real time, which means in questions of taking decisions in about 100 milliseconds. And uh, the uh, total throughput of events that an experiment like LHCB will have to uh, um, accept and digest is uh, at the end of the chain of uh, something like uh, 5 gigabytes per second per second of events that will have to be fully reconstructed. Now, in order to do this, they've been moving some of the algorithms into the so-called software-based filtering, and uh, uh, they are investigating the use of FPGAs and GPUs in order to be able to gain here the factor 100 that is still missing with respect to how the, uh, the uh, software performs today. Very similarly, uh, approaches, but for and for, keeping in mind around four, uh, are taken by the CMS experiment, which wants to port uh, uh, more, uh, some of the AV offline uh, tasks that we do today in terms of seconds, again into the software triggers, where the expected decision time is again of the order of uh, 100 milliseconds. And in order to do this, a very uh, thorough investigations of uh, use of GPUs uh, in the online uh, farms is being uh, ongoing. I would like also to uh, give uh, a moment about uh, um, what we're doing in terms of innovation, in particular this is uh, in the area of uh, quantum uh, computing. Uh, CERN Open Lab is engaging in this, is uh, further on uh, the horizon, but equally important. I've been uh, hearing already today people mentioning this with particular dedicated uh, uh, um, opportunities during the conference. Why we're looking at this is uh, 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 can uh, speed up the training of uh, deep learning, but also is well suited for uh, uh, operations that we do uh, regularly in high energy physics, uh, such as uh, minimization, optimization, and fitting. 
and of course can help directly on a number of calculations that we do in our field. So we have great hopes in quantum computing and we are fully engaged in this. We have, uh, uh, and I have uh, um, people from CERN Open Lab, uh, my colleagues from CERN Open Lab that are in the audience and I'm sure will be very happy to further elaborate on it. Moving to uh, machine learning. So, uh, this is the way in which we want really to exploit the new techniques and we are counting on the fact that the industry is a leader on uh, uh, artificial intelligence in order to do better uh, and, uh, in, in, the, in collaboration together. So, uh, I'm starting with something that uh, uh, is, uh, at least has always been um, and the first point of contact when we were talking to industry about uh, the use of uh, uh, data analytics and machine learning. This is the area of uh, monitoring automation and anomaly detection. It's an area where industry has a lot of expertise in order to create uh, complex uh, industrial systems. And we have also our experience now gained into, for instance, applying techniques like this on the uh, monitoring of the detectors and the accelerator infrastructure. And you have, in fact, uh, on the um, right hand side, uh, the uh, kind of multitude of uh, investigations which are ongoing on the in industrial control systems of the LHC machine. Um, at the same time, we can use monitoring and uh, automation in order to validate the quality of the data which is produced. And very importantly, to give us uh, help and insights about how we optimize our resources, in particular, very relevant for the future. The uh, two areas that uh, I'm going to uh, actually uh, briefly mention in the next couple of minutes are how we use machine learning techniques for those two important tasks that we are performing every day in high energy physics, which I said were reconstruction and simulation, because they are the most important consumers of our entire uh, uh, computing resources. Uh, there are investigations which are ongoing in order to be able to change the way in which we do reconstruction and actually use techniques like 3D image recognition techniques to identify physics objects from land patterns. And uh, this would be completely rev uh, revolutionary uh, with respect to how we do uh, reconstruction today and potentially might increase dramatically the speed uh, of the algorithms that we use. So it's a very, very important area of uh, ongoing work using deep learning. And you can see here the kind of complexity, again, of the occupancy of the tracks in the detectors at the high luminosity LHC, which makes it a very, very complex program. Um, simulation is also uh, one of the uh, uh, two uh, main uh, consumers of uh, resources. The approach here, in order to be prepared for the future, is uh, on one side uh, adapting the existing code to new computing architectures, it's a going work, at the same time, again, revolutionary thinking and replacing the complex algorithms with deep learning approaches. Uh, the, this effort is uh, um, known in our field as a fast simulation. And for this, we are looking at uh, generative advertorial networks in order to improve the speed of the algorithms, change the way in which they are done without giving up accuracy of the simulated events. And you can see on uh, the upper plots the kind of uh, agreements which have been already established which, uh, with the work that has been ongoing uh, for, uh, for a couple of years and uh, is now in open lab um, between the, uh, and the agreement between the data and the simulated data. So we, create, we have also here great hopes. Concluding, uh, in order to uh, really close the entire panorama of the, uh, what we do at CERN, uh, it is very important that we communicate, we share, and we investigate solutions with uh, communities. And in particular, uh, we have a very good uh, uh, collaboration with uh, uh, scientific uh, communities such as the one of SKA. Um, they, uh, they are uh, getting ready with the two telescopes 
Uh, one will be located in South Africa, the other one will be located uh, in uh, Western Australia. Um, like this, uh, being equipped with, uh, with this, uh, the uh, observatory will be able to give to the astronomers the capabilities of uh, studying the sky at unprecedented detail. But what does it mean in terms of uh, um, computing challenges? is that uh, they will uh, soon enter when they will become operational in mid 2020 um, the exabyte uh, this, the exa, uh, byte scale of, uh, for data storage uh, and very similar processing challenges to the ones that we are facing at the high luminosity LHC. The programs are basically happening together simultaneously so there is uh, an ongoing uh, collaboration with the SKA in order to tackle some of these challenges together and together with the industry. One last slide, I promise, before conclusions, uh, is about uh, uh, spin-off. I said at the beginning, uh, what we do at CERN is very important and uh, having uh, the capabilities to uh, uh, transfer our knowledge in uh, areas like uh, uh, accelerators is very important. In particular here, I'm giving an example of uh, a innovation that is uh, transferred from uh, CERN to uh, medical applications uh, in different areas, from the production of innovative isotopes for medical research to dosimetry, medical imaging uh, with the uh, investigations and uh, the uh, high technologies that we need to develop with detectors. Uh, of course, uh, accelerators uh, help us in order to give insights about the design of uh, uh, future adult therapy facilities and uh, the, um, in particular for the uh, beam collisions. Um, and at the same time, uh, uh, computing and simulation for uh, health applications uh, which is uh, uh, really within the reach of our expertise, uh, having experts in simulation. So I hope that uh, I have covered uh, most of the uh, uh, interesting challenges that are ongoing today at CERN. And I would like uh, to conclude that uh, we've been uh, pushing the boundaries of knowledge and technology for more than 60 years now. The next phase of the program will include an unprecedented computing challenge and we really hope and looking forward to tackling these challenges through an open collaboration and innovation uh, with industry and other scientific communities. And uh, uh, I'm going to share with you a quote that uh, is my preferred quote of what we do at CERN. Uh, it's not coming from me, it's coming from uh, a VIP visitor that we had some time ago at the time in which a famous film came out. Uh, magic is not happening at CERN, magic is uh, being explained at CERN. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maria, for a wonderful talk that has led us from the deepest questions of physics to the more challenges of computing that we're all here to explore at ISC. Uh, we have reached uh, beyond time that was scheduled. But, Two minutes. But Maria has promised, as you heard already, she will be at the coffee break and answer questions. And of course, we're all anxious to help CERN accomplishing these grand challenges and answer basic questions in physics. So please join Maria and myself at the coffee break, which is downstairs, two levels down. And please, uh, in spite of all those exciting conversations, come back here at 10.45 because there's more. See you soon. Thank you.